All right, welcome back guys. Today let's talk about how not to fry multi-rotor parts. When I first came to this hobby, I was the master of disaster. I fried everything. It was a daily ritual. Um, and I fried so many things that now i like the master of not frying things. I haven't fried anything in months, probably longer than that. Now I have an, an entire list. I've been thinking of things throughout the day and writing them down. I'm going to be going over everything, but in no particular order, so I do recommend sticking around for the entire video. I will say that the very first thing I want to talk about is the most overlooked thing, and guys don't even realize they're doing this. Whenever you buy motors, some motors do come with bolts, but a lot of guys are not checking the bolt links. Hold the bolt up to your frame, just like this, and notice how much is sticking through. So we got this much. Then look at the bottom side of your motor where the bolt screws into at this base plate and notice the thickness of it. Just from eyeballing it right now, I can already tell you that this bolt is going to go through this hole through this, the thickness of this mounting plate and it's going to be touching the copper windings of this motor. If the bolt touches the copper windings of the motor, one of two things is going to happen. Either the motor is going to fry or even if it doesn't fry, it's going to get really hot it's going to twitch and act really strange and sometimes when you're flying uh, a motor will just stop and your multi-rotor just flips and falls out the sky and crashes. So if your motors are getting really hot and acting strange that's the very first thing I would check. And for this reason I have bolts in every length. I've got five, six. They stop with the odd, num odd numbers after six so it goes eight, ten, twelve, and fourteen. If you do need an odd size bolt then just get a M3 washer like this. Uh, let's just say this is a uh, six millimeter, but we need a five millimeter. Place the washer on, you now have a five millimeter long bolt. And that way you can get the exact length that you need, and I always make it the exact thickness of my motor base plate. Now transitioning from that, Another reason why your motors get really hot is actually your PID D terms. If the D terms are set too high, then the motors will basically be overworking themselves and get really hot. And you can actually fry motors that way. So that's just another thing to check, your D terms. Now before we go any further, let me explain this. Uh, take your multimeter, set it to the continuity mode. If these leads, if you place it on anything and you get a beep, then that means wherever you're placing these on can conduct electricity. Carbon fiber does conduct electricity, believe it or not. I actually didn't learn this from the multi rotor hobby. I learned this uh, when I was in Afghanistan in the, in the infantry because the Taliban or ISIS, whatever you want to call them, they were making pressure plates using steel strips that would complete a circuit and blow up an IED to try to kill us. Uh, so then the army gave us metal detectors. So then they got smart and started using carbon fiber in their uh, pressure plates because the metal detectors couldn't detect the carbon fiber but it would still conduct or complete that circuit. So now every time I look at carbon fiber I think of that. Uh, but if we take these leads and we put it right on top of the carbon fiber frames we're not going to get anything. The reason for this is because they actually t come with a type of lamination on top of the carbon fiber uh, for two reasons. For one it makes it look really pretty the other reason is because if anything accidentally touches the carbon fiber with that lamination on top, it's going to help prevent a short. But if we take the leads and put it on the sides where they made the cuts and there is no lamination, we get that beep. So that just goes to prove that carbon fiber does conduct electricity. With that said, the very first thing I do when I get done building a multi-rotor, and I mean the first thing before I plug in a LiPo battery, take both leads and put it on your XT60 connector and you want to listen for a beep. If you are getting a beep, then you want to go through and recheck everything. You could have solder bridged in between a power and a ground source. You could have some wires uh, flip-flopped and backward. It could be anything. The other thing I will do is place one lead on the positive side, which is the square side, and then the other lead on the side of the carbon fiber frame, and listen for a beep again. Once again, if you are getting a beep, then you need to go back and recheck everything. If you put this on the negative side of the XC60 60, and then this on the side of the frame, you probably will get a beep. And that's actually normal. Don't worry about that. That's fine. Now with that said, uh, on all of my builds, I, I never do standoffs and then the PDB and then more standoffs and then the flight controller 
because I like keeping everything as compact as I can. So I mount my PEBs directly to the frame. But uh, some PEBs don't have pads on the backside and some do. Obviously one like this you would definitely want to place electrical tape on the bottom side. I do two strips one way and two strips the other way and then you're pretty much covered. But my point is even on these kinds of PEBs I still do that. The reason being is uh, how we can actually see through this one. So once you start soldering wires to the PDB, the solder can actually flow through these tiny little holes. And even if a microscopic piece of solder comes through and contacts your frame, something's going to fry. Now let's talk about these ESCs. What I mean is you have opto ESCs, which only have two small wires. It's going to be either yellow and brown or white and black, which is your signal and ground. These kind of ESCs are linear ESCs. They have a built-in back or voltage regulator and it comes with a third red wire. On your flight controllers you have the signal pin and then power in the middle and then ground towards the edge of the board. If you use these ESCs, don't use all four of these power wires on your flight controller. Only use one power wire from one ESC. And I already know someone's going to say, oh well actually JC, uh, with this type of regulator you can do that because but no don't do it don't do it there's absolutely no reason to do it one of these power wires from one ESC will provide enough current to power the flight controller receiver and anything else you connect to it so there's absolutely no reason to use four of these and I'm not even going to tell you which type of regulator it's okay to do that with because that's just going to add more confusion and like I said not to mention there's absolutely no reason to use four of these uh, you have linear regulators and then you have switching. I'm not even going to tell you which one you can do that with. Just don't do it. That leads me to my next point. If you are using a flight controller with a built-in voltage regulator, then you will use none of these small red wires. Because the flight controller is stepping the voltage down to 5 volts and powering everything connected to it on its own. So you don't want to use any of those wires. And here comes that guy again. Well, actually, with this type of regulator, no. Why would you do that? There's no reason. The flight controller is powering itself with 5 volts and everything connected to it. Therefore, you do not need that small red wire from the ESC. Don't do it. Now let's talk about wire color codes. Um, usually when you buy cameras and video transmitters, the colors of the wires are already in the correct order. Um, but if you order replacement harnesses like this one, I just plugged it in and we see the red wire is going to audio, the black wire is going to voltage, yellow to ground, and green to video. So if I were to wire this up according to these color codes, something's probably going to fry. So make sure you check that. One thing you can do is take a razor blade, lift up these tabs, pull the wires out one by one, reorganize them, and then plug them back in. My next tip is sometimes manufacturers can screw you over. Uh, this is a Lumineer 600 milliwatt video transmitter. Now this is the old one. I've had this forever. They have corrected this problem since then. I'll throw up a picture on your screen of how the wiring should be, but on this case it's telling me to the far left I have ground and then next to that I have power and then audio, video, and then ground on the far right. But the actual wiring is positive on the far left and then ground and on the far right it's power instead of ground. Point is, if I were to wire this up according to this case, it's going to fry. Now thankfully, I uh, saw a big orange box on GetFPV's website that said, whoa, wait, don't do that uh, because the writing is wrong. So thankfully I noticed that and didn't fry this. Voltage regulators on PDBs and flight controllers. A lot of guys fry stuff, especially the Omnibus flight controllers. I mean, uh, let me just talk about that for a second. This has a built-in voltage regulator, and it also has pins on this where they say that you can power your camera and video transmitter off of the flight controller itself. But even in my Omnibus videos, I've said it a million times, and guys still do it. They, they power the camera and video transmitter off of the board, and then the uh, LDO, you know, low dropout voltage regulator overheats and fries. And it's not just the Omnibus flight controllers, it's also PDBs with built-in regulators. You have to add up the current of everything that's being drawn from a certain device or certain board 
and figure out if you were drawing too much current or not. I can't remember what these omnibus boards are rated at, but guys are trying to power their receiver, their camera, their 600 milliwatt video transmitter, a, a GPS module, and God knows what else, and then they wonder why these things fry. And same thing goes for PDBs. Um, I've seen guys overload this, uh, you know, with basically the same stuff. They also throw in LEDs and God knows what else. So just add up the milliamps of every device and make sure you are not overloading these things. Now moving on, uh, I just want to mention, I mean, this is really obvious, but make sure that you are powering your devices with the correct amount of voltage. Some cameras only operate off of 5 volts. Some video transmitters only operate off of 12 volts. Um, so in that case, make sure you're using a PB with a 5 volt and 12 volt voltage regulator built in. And if you want to avoid all of that completely, you could just purchase video transmitters and cameras that are rated at a really high voltage. They're, they have some products coming out nowadays that are rated for over 20 volts. So if you use a 3 or 4S battery, you're good no matter what. Just get power directly off your PDB, you have nothing to worry about. Also with Spectrum satellite receivers, I see a lot of guys trying to power those with 5 volts off the flight controller, but those receivers actually use 3.3 volts. And then finally we have capacitors. I actually made a separate video talking about capacitors, placing them on your PDB uh, to help with the voltage spikes from the active braking from multi-shot and D-shot and even some one-shot 125 ESCs if you do have it turned on. So I'm not going to talk about it in this video. I'll just leave a link to it in the description below so you can check it out there. And there's also other benefits to using capacitors. Like, uh, I, Actually, I'm not even going to go into it. Just watch that video. And that's going to wrap it up for this one, guys. I actually have more than that, but I feel like this video has gone long enough. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon.